Hello, and welcome to the Work Inspired Podcast. I'm your host, George Lucas Pfeiffer. On today's episode, we've got a very special guest, Kamina Brooks, who is the Director of Development in Chicago for the Community Builders. She was also recently recognized as a 40 Under 40 recipient by Crane Chicago. She's here today to talk about the incredibly important work that her company is doing around the issue of affordable housing. Let's not waste another second. Work Inspired starts right now. Well, Kamina, thank you so much for being here. Real excited to talk to you about what your story and about what you're doing at Community Builders. Thanks for being here, especially in person. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Really excited to have this conversation today. I first came across your story when you were featured in the Cranes 40 Under 40 last year. I thought you've just got this great background and the work that you're doing is so inspiring. But tell our listeners, kind of, how did you get to where you're at right now? Yeah, no, that's a really great <laughs> question. And I will go back a little bit to my childhood. Okay. I actually grew up in Prince George's County, Maryland, mm. uh, which is right outside of Washington, D.C., at a time when Prince George's County was the richest black county in the United States. Mm. And at that time, I you know, saw myself and family and friends and all the access that we had in our community and the opportunities compared to traveling to other areas, other city states, and seeing communities that look like mine from a uh, race standpoint, but not having the same opportunities and access as my community had. And so as a young person, I really wanted to be a part of how do I play a role in my future professional life in creating opportunities that maybe not be the same as mine, but have some similarities mm. with ensuring that young people and families have the same type of access to all the things that anybody would want for their family to grow and thrive. You know, access to health, quality health care, access to schools, grocer, uh, amenities, um, athletic opportunities. And so that really was what started my uh, passion for an interest in affordable housing. Mm. I went to school originally thinking that as a uh, designer, I would change change community. And so went to undergrad and got my degree in interior architecture, mm. went to grad school and got a master in urban design. So kind of had the micro macro mm -hmm. perspective. And then it was in grad school where I learned about real estate development and how it brings investments mm. into communities. And so right after grad school, had the opportunity to spend one year at the housing authority in Charlotte, Charlotte Housing Authority in North Carolina. After working there for a year, I uh, had the good fortune again to start working for a developer who was just starting her own firm. Mm. Actually, the firm was incorporated maybe four months before I started working there. Uh. And I came in and they were looking for somebody to work hard, roll up their sleeves and figure it out. And so, you know, I was figuring it out <laughs> and figuring out how to do development as they were growing mm -hmm. the business and really cut my teeth and learn how to do affordable mixed income housing, community development there mm. and spent six years there before moving to Chicago to work for the community builders and um, it's been an incredible journey, and I've been fortunate to really get to do daily what I was hoping to do as a young person, and that was really make an impact in communities that have for so long not received necessary investments that they need. So that's, first of all, pretty cool that you you recognized at a young age what you wanted to do. And although the path changed a little bit, not that much, though. I mean, right. architecture and, and real estate work hand in hand. I think special that you had a focus based off of your, your upbringing and being able to have the perspective to see, I want this for others. Mm -hmm. And knew, knowing that young that you were going to give something back or yeah. make an effort to at least. So why Chicago? Was it, was it community builders and the role that brought you here? Or was there something about, you know, did you have choices to where you were going to go in the country? Working in North Carolina, we were working from Virginia to Georgia, mm -hmm. really enjoyed that organization um, that I formerly worked for, but always had an, sh had a strong interest for the city of Chicago. Mm. Having studied design, you, you don't open a, a book in architecture, urban design, and, and not read about Chicago. Mm -hmm. I visited the city and really loved all the, the benefits that a urban city like Chicago provides. And so 
when the opportunity presented itself to come and interview for the community builders, I said, well, I love where I'm mm -hmm. at, but I also love this city. I'm going to take the chance and, you know, see what happens. And then uh, six years later, I'm here. I uh, got offered the job. And, and one of the reasons why I was not only interested to move into Chicago, but also interested in working for the community builders is because I wanted to grow um, the scale in which I was working on, mm -hmm. projects in which I was working on. Mm -hmm. And so TCB is, TCB, the community builders at the time was bringing me in to focus on restarting a Hope 6 redevelopment. And for those who aren't familiar, Hope Six was a uh, federal funded program that invested in the redevelopment of former public housing sites. And mm -hmm. so uh, the community builders had a development that they were, had been working on for over uh, a decade and had already delivered nearly 1,000 units and several square feet of community amenities, but um, were looking for someone to come in and manage the next several phases. Mm -hmm. And so I was brought in to work on that and have since started and or completed uh, multiple phases in that community and uh, beyond have begun working outside of not only that neighborhood, but have been working now throughout the city of Chicago and leading efforts to advance affordable mixed income housing, um, as well as neighborhood amenities. Awesome. Well, you're right about the architecture piece. Obviously, Chicago's known for that. And I also think you're scaling up in the opportunity piece. If you're looking at this geography, there's a huge opportunity with affordable housing in the city of Chicago. We'll talk a little bit about how it's a national you know, issue that needs addressing mm -hmm. as well. But I'm sure that that didn't hurt that you were moving to a, a city where there was a great amount of opportunity to make positive change. A absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the city of Chicago, the numbers tend to move, but the need for affordable housing is over 200,000. Mm -hmm. um, and the amount of resources, not just in the city of Chicago, but nationally, currently are not enough to reduce that deficit significantly. Mm -hmm. However, the work still needs to be done because right. if we don't do anything, then we'll never get to where we need to go mm -hmm. with um, moving the needle on addressing uh, the need for housing, mm -hmm. housing stability, housing affordability. So let's talk about what that work looks like. What does the community builders do and what makes the company kind of unique and special in that offering? Yeah, so TCB, we are a actually a 60-year-old organization. Mm -hmm. I'll say that because this year we are celebrating our 60th anniversary. Congratulations. And so our mission is to build and sustain strong communities where people of all incomes can thrive. Mm. And so how do we live out that mission? We do that, really, we have a three-pronged approach. We do real estate development, okay. and we build and sustain mixed income, affordable housing, as well as community uh, development, community assets. We also provide property management. We've got our own in-house property management who oversees many of the properties in which we develop. Okay. And then lastly, but just as important, we have a, a team called Community Life. Mm -hmm. And our Community Life team provides wraparound services uh, to support the residents in mm -hmm. the communities in which we serve. They work with the residents to identify their own personal goals and help them achieve those goals. And mm -hmm. so that's our approach to the work that we do in communities. But if I drill in on the real estate side you know, and talk a little bit about things that make us unique, mm -hmm. TCB, we, uh, we really pride ourselves with taking on the complex, the complicated mm -hmm. projects, the complicated work whether that is the complex projects to do and deliver housing through uh, complex financial modeling. For example, in, in this region, we at least have two recent projects that I can point to that have more than 10 sources, hmm. more than 10 financial sources in our capital stack. And for those who do development, they um, certainly real estate development, they understand how complicated and complex that is. Sure. But we do that not to say, hey, we have did it, check a box, but we do it because many times it's needed to close gaps mm. to advance projects. And so we're willing to roll up our sleeves and really take on the complex financial modeling. We're willing to take on the complex acquisitions mm -hmm. as well as 
projects that may be complicated, may be challenging to operate. We'll take those on and and we do this to really live out our mission, mm -hmm. to really ensure that our end goal is met and that's to provide housing, to provide services in communities and for people and families who need it most. The work that TCB does, is that in just in Chicago or is it outside, is it a What's the geography that you guys do work in? Actually, when I mentioned that we celebrated 60 years, mm -hmm. we started in Boston okay. as a small CDC. Mm -hmm. And so our headquarters to this day is still in Boston. Okay, We are now in 12 states plus oh. Washington, D.C. Mm. We're as far west as our, our region here, which is known as the Midwest region, mm -hmm. we work in Chicago and Chicago suburbs. And so we are, and then we're far south as North Carolina. Oh, wow. And and so we work uh, throughout the nation and have been doing that, like I said, for 60 years. Are you a not-for-profit? We are. Not we are a national not-for-profit. Not Excellent. Mm -hmm. It sounds like there's a lot of work going on. What does the team look like? And we'll get into some of that work in a second, but since... Our business is creating workspaces. I always love to, yeah. to, to ask, what, what's your team look like? How are you working currently? What's the culture like? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our region specifically. Sure. Um, our, but our overall organization is about 500 plus people. Okay. Here in this region, we have about 70 individuals. Mm -hmm. wow. And of the 70, we've got, we have about 10 people who work in development and design and construction. Our office is right in the loop at 135 South LaSalle. We... Come in, at, you know, I know that's, this is always a question is, are yep. you hybrid? Are you remote? Mm -hmm. We actually come into the office three days a week right oh, now. Nice. And so we definitely feel that it's necessary for people to be in the office and collaborate with one another in person. Mm -hmm. We can collaborate over Zoom and Teams as well, but it's, it's you know, value to being able to walk by someone in the office, at the break room, knock on their door and have, you know, the spontaneous conversations. And mm -hmm. so especially as an office with both uh, individuals who've been at the organization for nearly 20 years and individuals who have been at the organization for less than a year, it's important to have that mentorship, mm -hmm. that support. And so we certainly are, um, we certainly provide that uh, through in, in our office. And you know, our, our office is just an incredible group of talented individuals that have are new in, in, in the field of affordable and mixed income housing and are learning and growing and are passionate about the space mm -hmm. to individuals who, like myself and our regional VP, who've been in the industry for over a decade, a couple mm -hmm. decades now um, for some. So um, it's just it's a great mix of, of, of team members to work with. You probably also spend quite a bit of time out in the communities that you're developing and serving as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And oftentimes when we are doing that, we have to be flexible mm -hmm. because there are members that we work with in the community that they may also be working a day job. And so we have to be flexible in how we go out into the communities, when we go out to the communities, and and also um, just thoughtful mm -hmm. about being being. Uh, a, a part of the community in a way that feels authentic mm -hmm. and spending time in the community. And um, I'll get into just a brief example of one of the projects that we're working on out on the west side in the West Garfield Park neighborhood, known as the Sankofa Village Wellness Center. Mm -hmm. We've been working on in that community now for going on about four years. And our development is expected to start construction this year. And we have we didn't go in the community with the intent of this is our idea we want to present it this is what we're going to build we went into the community and were asked to to enter into the community by Rush University Medical Center mm -hmm. because West Garfield Park has one of the lowest life expectancies in the city of Chicago and so we um, went into the community and met with stakeholders in the community residents and um, religious institutions and um, community organizations and sat down with them. Surveys were conducted by organizations to get a sense for what does the community want and need. Mm. And so we aligned ourselves with the community goals to then bring to life the vision for what is now known as the Sankofa Village Wellness Center. Mm. And we've been fortunate to really have a strong uh, community a strong group of community stakeholders to partner with and to advance that project, as well as securing financing, as well as getting the word out about the effort 
as well as bringing in other institutional partners in healthcare and um, community health and wellness as well. So it's been, uh, to answer your question, we certainly do spend time in the community building relationships and sustaining those, those relationships as well. And I think the connection that I would make there is that whether you're in an office together or you're in the community together, you talked about you know, the passion people have for the work, the reason why you at a young age said, yeah. this is what I want to do, to be around others who, ch who share that energy, you know, it feeds off one another. And that's why we think, you know, flexibility is key, yeah, truly. But being together and being able to share those, you know, those same desires, I think it's so strong from a human connection perspective, whether you're in the community or in the office. Let's talk a little bit about... Um, affordable housing, an issue or a concept, like why is it such a hot discussion point right now? Why is it top of mind for a lot of leaders, whether they're in government or in urban planning? Why is it a problem or why are we talking about it? We've been talking about it for, for years mm -hmm. and we will continue to talk about affordable housing. And that goes back to the partly the point I previously made about the need. Mm -hmm. There's certainly a strong demand for affordable housing. And as we continue to look at wages mm -hmm. as one example of wages not moving simultaneously with the increase of the cost of living, mm. the need for affordable housing will continue to grow. Okay. And when we think about cities and being able to sustain and keep our population and grow our population, if we aren't simultaneously growing the wages mm -hmm. for people, then we're going to continue to grow that gap for mm -hmm. affordable housing. And so as leaders in cities, they're constantly thinking about how do I ensure that my citizens mm -hmm. have affordable access to stay and live in my city, my town, mm -hmm. my region. And so that's one piece mm -hmm. because people, if, if people can't afford to live and work in a city, mm -hmm. then they either one, don't have access to the 20 other things that they need to to support their their families, mm -hmm. whether that's ensuring uh, quality health care, uh, whether that's going out to the movies, mm -hmm. going out and, and supporting their children with youth uh, activities and things like that, then they're going to either not do that or they're going to say, I'm going to move to a city that's more affordable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if we can ensure that we're creating affordable housing so that all Chicagoans or whatever city we're in um, has a, a opportunity, has an option mm -hmm. um, to to live and only pay 30, 35 percent of their income on housing, then they're going to more likely stay in that city. Mm -hmm. They're going to more likely go out and spend money on other items and other opportunities within the city beyond, you know, food, shelter, and transportation. Mm -hmm. And so affordable housing will continue to be a priority unless we, one, make a dramatic shift in how we deliver affordable housing to close the gap quicker, mm -hmm. and or two, make a more dramatic shift in the wages that people earn so that people are able to uh, pay and afford higher uh, cost of living. Sure. The, the other side of that is, okay, let's figure out a way to get these people more money, right? And my personal perspective, based off of what we saw happen during COVID, where the government was stipending people that couldn't work, you mm -hmm. saw people leaving warehouse, you know, factory jobs, essential employees saying, I'm getting paid more to stay at home than go to the job. So that highlights that problem. Right. So some of it's going to be, that's that's one way that we can all share in the solution is we pay a little bit more, but right. it means higher wages. Now, the other side of that is, are there ways to lower the cost? Right to live, right? And I think one of the reasons I've heard that affordable housing makes a lot of sense is that currently, if you've got housing in one area that's lower income, mm -hmm. and then people have to commute into a city like Chicago where there's no affordable housing, you know, in the loop or wherever it might be, then those people are forced to make that commute, which can mm -hmm. be expensive. The, the amenities around those areas, parking, food, whatever, mm -hmm. they're expensive. And so just the cost to work is high. Right. When you meet with your investors, or I'm interested to know who your stakeholders are on some of these developments, and we'll get into that, but is that part of the solution is to say, if we can mix incomes and we, we can provide more equity or, or accessibility to people to be closer to where they do these jobs, 
and not the jobs that are out far out, right. you know, that are lower paying, but closer to higher paying jobs? Is that open doors for opportunities to solve both problems at once? There's not one, of course, one solution. Mm-hmm. But uh, but to your point, that is one opportunity. Mm. And so it's actually one that we are looking at and we have a proposal for a project in the loop. Mm. Our objective or mission around that project is to provide housing in the loop mm. that is affordable particularly for our working class mm. that and our essential working class mm-hmm. and you mentioned there were many individuals that had to commute to the loop even during the pandemic mm-hmm. most of the individuals that were commuting into the loop during the pandemic were essential workforce mm-hmm. but many of those individuals can't afford to live in the loop mm-hmm. and so one of our development proposals, uh, which we were selected to advance a proposal at a site in the loop at um, at State and Van Buren, proposing to put over 100 units of affordable housing for uh, workforce making between $88,000 a year to $23,000 a year. Hmm. And the amount of housing that already exists for that income in the loop is less than 1%. Wow. wow. And so- we continue to explore opportunities in what are called opportunity areas Mm -hmm. that are neighborhoods that have jobs, that have quality schools, Mm -hmm. that have access to grocer healthcare, all the other components that make up what's called the social determinants Mm -hmm. of of health. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is uh, something that we uh, are are working on and and continue to explore as well as other, of course, developers throughout the, throughout the city. So you talked about one one of the other, the other side effects or consequences of not af- having affordable housing is people will move to where they can afford to live, and um, and where does Chicago rank? I mean, obviously, let's compare it to other large urban environments. You know, I've heard that affordability is one of Chicago's opportunities compared to some of these other major cities. From an affordable housing perspective, where does it kind of sit on a national scale? When you compare it to many other comparable larger cities, Mm -hmm. it is more affordable. Mm -hmm. But people aren't leaving to go to the other larger cities. They're leaving to go to the southern cities, which is why cities like Austin, Charlotte, Houston are growing at significant rates. Mm -hmm. We can't solely compare ourselves to the larger cities. We have to also look at where are people leaving to go Mm -hmm. and why are they going there and how do we combat that to ensure that we are staying competitive. Mm-hmm. You know, people come to Chicago for job opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't come for the weather, mm-hmm. I'll say. Although, <laughs> you know, this past yeah. winter has been has been mild. Um, but people come for job opportunities, but job opportunities also align with where can I live? Mm-hmm. Where can I live affordably, comfortably? Um, where can I send my family to school? Mm-hmm. And so all those are also important factors. Um, but to answer your question, you know, I think Chicago, if if I could, you know, think about, of course, where I've worked throughout the East Coast and now in, in Chicago, Chicago is, from a standpoint of affordability, it's it's well situated. Mm. Um, if you compare to other, again, major cities, mm. even on the West Coast, but again, people aren't necessarily leaving larger cities to go to other larger cities if affordability is an issue. And that's a great point. And that's why this is a national problem is because we need labor. So if the labor leaves, the city is in trouble. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about those stakeholders. I'm very interested because I think there is, I mean, I just uh, put together a panel last week and we had... um, uh, someone from the mayor's office. We had the head of World Business Chicago. We had Chu Chicago. So we had very pro Chicago people okay. uh, yeah. sitting on this panel, and we talked a lot about the ownership of government mm-hmm. versus business to be a partner in solving this problem. I think it's safe to say that it's up to all of us. But who's leading? Is this a government-led solution, or you know, um, are you talking more to private investors that want to step up and say? we're going to we're going to help lead change here. I would say that it is a both and. Okay. I, I I wish that I could say it's one or the other and but but it's not. It's It's probably good that it's both. Right. Yeah. And so the government has a, and and does play a significant role in addressing the need for affordable housing but does so in partnership with the private sector. Mm. 
And and the reason why I say both and because the government is also looking at the private sector to help generate ideas and innovation mm. for how to how does uh, affordable housing get addressed and whether it's funding and financing, whether it's how do we address the rising costs mm. to deliver housing, things like that are are important. And so government is is partnering with our industry, but our industry not just with development, but also there are other partners that should play a role. And I can go down a long list mm. because it's, you know, we we utilize what's called low income housing tax credits, which we receive from the state or city, but it comes from an allocation from the federal government. Mm -hmm. And then we sell those credits on to, you know, banks, syndicators, and so forth. And so even they play a role mm -hmm. in addressing affordable housing and and they generate ideas and innovation as well. So how do we partner with um, with the with those organizations to say this right now isn't working. Mm -hmm. And you know, I can go on a whole tangent about how we can, you know, is there a way to kind of relook at the low income housing tax credit mm -hmm. model and how it delivers affordable housing. Um, but I will not do that uh, <laughs> today. But also their partners even beyond the who's been partners for the last, you know, the the Litech industry started in 86. So for the past nearly what 40 years, um, there's partners in the healthcare industry now. Mm. And so that's one piece that is, it, I would say, maybe it's starting to emerge mm. over the last several years. And then you have businesses, you know, you hear the Amazon and Googles who are saying, you know, we need to also address affordable housing. And so there are different ideas that are being put out there, but I think there needs to be a more holistic approach. Mm on how we shift the model from uh, low-income housing tax credits being the main way to deliver affordable housing. Mm. That's, again, one model, but there are, there are multiple other examples that are starting to come into play now, and those really need to be uplifted. Listen to a panel yesterday that was focused on attainable housing, mm. and you have individuals who are doing uh, modular housing now and uh, individuals who are bringing in other types of low impact funds to deliver, uh, call it workforce housing that isn't using the same type of subsidy mm. that we use to deliver rental. But they're still, you know, maybe not getting up yet to the scale to do 100, 200 unit developments, but they're still addressing the need for providing affordable housing. Mm. And so um, I do think that there are many stakeholders at play on the private and the public side. But I also think that the way that we've been doing affordable housing for the past several decades, it needs to be uh, uh, revamped and relooked at and open up for opportunities to do other type of models that yeah. bring in and increase uh, increase housing mm. as well. Yeah, it seemed because I because I was thinking about this. I mean, the government incentive piece makes sense. If the government's going to set aside money to help solve the problem, that's one model, right? Mm -hmm. The the business side and the financial, you know, the economic side of other models is what seems a little bit confusing to figure out, right? So it's nice to hear that they're being considered. Mm -hmm. Even as you were talking, I was thinking like, what would one look like? You know, would it be you know the the loop, for example? They're struggling, you know, so maybe the businesses that make up or the developers or the building owners say, well, we're going to put a fund together that's going to help to address this problem because at the end of the day, it benefits us right. or we're hedging our risks for this continuing to decay because no one's here, you know? Right. So, yeah, it's very interesting. So how would someone, as those models develop or get piloted, how do people get involved? Oh, that then that's a that's a good question. It's it's being aware of what is going on in the mm -hmm. housing industry. So if you're not in the industry, you may not hear or know as much about it. But I would encourage folks who are interested to get connected one with like, like let's first start with getting connected with you know your local alderman, mm -hmm. your local ward alderman, and starting to say how can I get mm -hmm. involved with addressing the need for housing, addressing the need for community development. Mm. And they will start to point you to individuals in the ward or and or in your city, city of Chicago mm. or other cities, to say this is who and whom you should get connected with. Mm. And and there's different ways to get involved. One is to be a supporter of mm. affordable housing. No one will ever turn you down for being a Yimby. <laughs> and so uh, to be a, a, a vocal supporter of saying yes 
that you want to see affordable housing in your neighborhood, mm. that you want to see affordable housing throughout the city because it's important to the economics of the city, it's important to the continued growth mm -hmm. and sustainability of the city. If, if anyone who's maybe not as entrenched in housing the way that someone like I am um, wants to at least say, hey, I want to support, I'd say starting with your local alderman, mm -hmm starting with local community organizations that support affordable housing, support community development is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think telling that story is so important because I think there's probably a number of people that see it as charity or as something that's a nice thing. You know, like it's the same way some people look at ESG and sustainability. Like we should do this, you know, but there's a real impact to not it's doing it, you know. And so right. being real about that and showing cause and effect of mm -hmm. a solution or a lack of solution, I think is so important in this mm -hmm. case. We were talking lightly before you came in because we build out workspaces. So when you say, oh, there's all these these workspaces that they can't get people to come to, let's just convert them into housing. And we're like, oh, no. But when you think about the concept of live, work, play and like the success of a neighborhood like Fulton, you know, yeah where you can bring people in and have them not have to com completely commute into a completely different geography to go to their work, mm -hmm. you're going to have more thriving businesses there. Mm -hmm. And so I think, to your point, it, there, is a, there is a reason to do it. Let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, you played college basketball. I uh, heard you had, were successful at North Carolina while you were there, University of North Carolina. Greens, North Carolina, Greensboro. Greensboro. I, I, you know, not a Tar Heel, no, okay. but yeah. So I'm interested, when you're approaching problems or leading your team, the work you're doing with TCB, do you draw on your experience as a, an athlete? Uh, yes. Yeah? <laughs> yes. You know, once an athlete, always an athlete. Mm -hmm. I played sports for a couple decades and have uh, really pride myself with being a team player, mm -hmm. but also acknowledging that on a team, everyone has roles. Mm -hmm. And all roles are important, no matter if you're you don't ever get in the game, but you support by cheering on your team, by playing hard in practice to being the star player. Mm. There's always a role to every person on the team to meeting and achieving goals. Mm. And so that was something that certainly had been drilled into me as a youth growing up playing basketball and absolutely in college. Mm. Uh, play, I did play Division One, so that was uh, goals and achieving goals was identified from day one mm. and talked about at every practice mm. and in everything that you did when you step on the court. And so I really bring that to work every day. It's about what are the goals and what, and our goals at TCB, it's, it's the goals also align with the mission mm. and the mission aligns with my personal and professional values. Mm. And so when I walk in to work every day, it's about I, knowing what my role is on the team and making sure that I go 110% at mm. that and then supporting others as they help as they start to navigate and learn their roles as well on the team. And so that's one piece, but it's also being a, a, a just a, I would say a champion and cheerleader of this work. Mm. And I'm, was just as I was passionate about basketball, just as passionate about this work. And mm. so whether it's advocating for resources to advance a particular effort and or to change uh, uh, policies, procedures, processes, to also providing mentorship and uh, guidance for young people entering and or wanting to learn more about this industry. Mm. I um, was a captain on the team a couple of years, and so I understand that balance of doing and also supporting, and mm -hmm. so try to lead uh, with with that with that in mind and bring in those skills that I learned on the basketball court in my different roles uh, playing basketball over the years. Well, let's tie basketball then back to affordable housing. What does a win look like? What does winning a game look like in affordable housing, and what does winning the title look like? Winning a game and winning the title. Winning a game is uh, securing major financing. Mm. And often that is securing a low-income housing tax credit award or with the Wellness Center, securing the Chicago Prize grant through the Prisker Trial Foundation. That's winning a game. Mm. Winning the title is closing on the financing that will then allow the project to start construction. Mm. Because getting to that point, 
there are a lot of hurdles. Mm. There are a lot of uh, uh, rebounds to make, mm. uh, passes to catch, mm. interceptions that are made. Yeah. And, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and so you got to continue to fight and show up every day and win a lot of games along the way mm. to get to that closing. And that closing is is the title. I like that. I like that question, that analogy. <laughs> so I, I had to think a little bit about it, but that's absolutely is closing and starting construction is winning the title. Mm. And so uh, in our work, you've got to win a lot of titles mm. though. So uh, you, you need to close a, a, a number of deals to, to be sustainable mm. from a business standpoint, but also to uh, really move the needle mm-hmm. in, in, in this, in this industry. Mm-hmm. I love that answer. You've had success in your career um, on and off, off the court. Uh, what's what's a resource that's been valuable to you that you could recommend to others? The greatest resource really has been other people. Mm. And I wish that there was one resource that I could point to and say, you know, read this book, Google this article, but the greatest resource has been other people. Mm-hmm. And it's been mentors and it's been mentees mm. that's absolutely been for me m- my my great my greatest uh, resource and i continue to lean in on people and also i'm welcoming and open for people to lean in on me mm. to help navigate this space you talked about a passion for helping others as they maybe want to learn more or enter the industry what's something that you tell them Build relationships and value those mm. relationships. Build authentic relationships, mm. meaningful relationships, and and truly value and cherish them. Mm. And that's one piece. But also, be willing to uh, do the work. Be willing to learn. Be willing to grow from what you learn. That's equally as important, especially during these times when we can kind of hide behind the computer desk mm-hmm. and slow roll through the day, mm-hmm. it's, you know, you, you really have to immerse yourself in the work and be willing to learn from any and everything and anybody. And, and you're learning to figure out what do you want to take away um, as you continue to, to grow and model your own career. Mm. And some may be something that you take away and some may be say, it's something that I don't want to do it this way. Yeah. And that's that to me is just as valuable. Mm-hmm. But I would say build relationships and value those relationships. Be willing to do and be willing to learn. Mm. Well, I'm glad you moved to Chicago. Mm. I can't you. say thank you enough for the work you're doing and all the the exciting and important things the community builders are doing. Thank you for being here on this show and thanks for your insight today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a joy to talk to you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to rate our show. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Work Inspired Podcast so that you don't miss any of the incredible guests we have planned for upcoming episodes. We'll continue to find the best and brightest minds in business so that you can learn, grow, and succeed, and so that we can all work inspired. Work Inspired is brought to you by BOS, a leader in commercial working environments and a Hayworth best-in-class dealership. Experience our 360 approach and discover the team, tools, and techniques required to navigate the complexity of your next workspace at BOS.com. If you have ideas, feedback, or would like to be featured on our show, please email podcast at BOS.com. Thank you for listening. This has been a Workspace Digital production. If you're interested in launching a podcast at your organization, please email info at workspace.digital for a free consultation.